I'm Roberta Hestiness. I'm a Californian. I didn't know there was a word, Chairman. I thought everyone was a facilitator. My journey was one of being raised in an irreligious home that not only forbade the children to be involved in religion in any form, but was very hostile to Christianity with which my parents were much disabused. The response I had to that was to be aware of a hunger within that I had no name for and no way to satisfy. And it wasn't until I went to college that I there experienced what I had never heard about, had no labels for, had no language to describe, but which I soon came to call a conversion experience of faith in Jesus Christ. It was for me an utterly life-shaking, transformative, amazing experience. The Bible was a book that we did not have in our home, and on the day that I came to faith, I took the only money I had, which was very, very little. I was on a full scholarship with no help from home. And I went and bought my first Bible. And I began to read it. And from that day to this day, I would have to say that my own spiritual experience has been deeply rooted in several things. One has been an inward awareness of the presence and reality of God. A second has been the way in which uh, in and through and beyond the actual words on the page, I encounter God through the scriptures. And the third has been the experience of Christian community. <laughs> from an alcoholic and violently abusive home, I did not believe that it was possible for human beings to care about each other and to love. And I experienced a small Christian community on my campus that taught me I was very wrong about that. It was not a perfect community as no community of faith ever is. But it was a community that embraced me and became what has been from that day to this family for me. It was a community, though, in which I experienced some tension, and I found my journey as a Christian feminist to be full of these kinds of tensions because I came to faith in a very small Quaker fellowship. In fact, I was the 60th member of that particular community of faith. At the same time as the people who were the most influential in teaching me what Christian faith was, how to understand it, what it meant, and how to live it out, were people out of a tradition that I later learned could be called dispensational fundamentalism, a very conservative, patriarchal, hierarchical tradition. And so built right in to my earliest experience as a Christian was the radical equality in my Quaker meeting and the strong theme of patriarchy and male domination coming out of that particular fundamentalist tradition. I worked for many years to make sense of it, 
decided ultimately they were irreconcilable. And I ended up eventually in my theological home, which could probably be best described as a new light Presbyterian, a revivalist and yet reformed Presbyterian. One of the pivotal experiences I had was that I spent a summer working with a Christian group that worked on college campuses across the country. It is true of the tradition that I am part of that much of the energy of that tradition is not within the denominational boundaries, but is within what is labeled parachurch boundaries, associations, movements of Christians, of which the YMCA would be an early example, and the Christian movement that I was part of was another. We had a camp on Catalina Island off the coast of Los Angeles, and I went and spent the summer after my conversion on that particular island, working in that camp, running the bookstore as a volunteer. And I got very restless being around all of these religious Christian people all the time. (laughs) It wasn't what I was used to, and it felt very confining, although it, it had some wonderful things about it. And so I asked permission from the camp director if I could go into the resort town of Avalon and do some Christian outreach. And I was given permission to do that. Evangelism was very much a part of our tradition. And so I went into Avalon, and I began just talking to people on the street and in the stores and um, gathered a group of about 18 people that began a home Bible study, interactive discussion group. And in that particular experience, well over two-thirds of those people made Christian professions for the first time in their life. And I was having a wonderful time um, reaching out, being challenged by the diversity of that particular group that crossed all the boundaries that I knew about, until the day when the camp director got me aside. And he said to me, you know, we're very happy about the outreach work that you are doing in Avalon, but you know it's not appropriate, don't you? And I said, what do you mean it's not appropriate? And he said, well, really, it ought to be done by a man. And I said, what? And he said, yes, um, we've decided that there's a young man that's been coming with you into town. Now, I don't want to, um, even at this late date, belittle belittle or belabor, but he was stupid. (laughs) (laughs) And I said... To the camp director, he doesn't know anything about the scripture. Now, I was a whole three months deep myself. (laughs) He has no real understanding. He's just been coming along for the ride. And the director said, it doesn't matter, he's male. And so wanting to be submissive, as I had been taught to do, I handed over this group. And I proceeded to watch it with weeping as it died. And I asked a question at that point, which was, which is the more important thing here? You know, whether or not you're finding a way to share the love which you have experienced and discovered, or that the person who does that sharing comes wrapped in maleness. I didn't get it worked out, but I was deeply troubled by that. And then it was time to marry, and one of the things that had happened to me very shortly after my conversion experience was that I had gone forward to the altar in our tiny little church and had experienced a call of God on my life. We talked about it as a call to full-time Christian service. And the way in which I understood you had to work a call like that out, because it really was very important was you find a good Christian man who has a call, and you marry him. And so I did. (laughs) 
And I was very fortunate in the man that I married. We have been married 43 years since that time. But as we started off in seminary together, he was the student and I was the wife. And I remember the courses for two years as I sat there and listened to the professors with me in the front row saying, as they began each day, gentlemen. My husband soon discovered that he was not suited for missionary work or the pastorate. He's a biophysicist research <laughs> professor. <laughs> And I discovered that I was hungry for everything that I could get out of that particular situation. And um, I began then uh, learning more, growing deeper in my faith, but with these issues of male-female unresolved. We moved to Seattle for John to get his doctorate. And he was invited to become an adult Bible teacher in the largest church in the Pacific Northwest. And he said to the pastor who had invited him to do that, that he would not do it unless his wife could be in the course as well. And for some reason, we knew that that was an exceedingly important place to draw a line. And the pastor of that church, who then became uh, dearly beloved to me and a mentor of mine, made the decision reluctantly against his theology that he wanted my husband enough that he would let me come along. And the experience I had that was that within three weeks I was teaching that course <laughs> with 25 adults in it about half of them university professors. And I began leading then faculty Bible studies on the campus at the University of Washington. And I was asked if I would join the staff of that church and become the main Bible teacher. And it was a weird invitation because there wasn't a single person in authority at that church that believed that women could do that. And it came a time where I was in a dilemma between the two worlds that I was functioning in, the world of the university where they were asking me to consider a career working in that area. And a day came when a new pastor was at the church and I went to my first national denominational conference. I was running a ministry to singles with about 200 young single people in that work. And the pastor came to me and said that he'd been asked to do a workshop on singles. He had never been inside the ministry that I was leading. But he asked me if I'd please write his workshop for him and that he would be giving that workshop at the conference. And I was agitated. (laughs) By now, I had read The Feminine Mystique. (laughs) And I did it, and I went to the conference, and there was not a single woman on the platform. And of 50 workshops, there was only one, led by two women. And I made the decision in the middle of that conference that there was no place for a woman in my tradition. And I went for a long walk with the man that had been my mentor, and I told him I've made the decision to leave the church, and I'm going to the university. And he said to me, you can't do that. And I said, why can't I? And he said, because God has called you. And I said, but you do not believe in the ordination of women. And he said, I am wrong. I am wrong. I know you are called. And it was a turning point in my life because I made the decision then that I would stay. And I have stayed. And during my subsequent career where I've been a college president and a theological seminary professor, all of that time I have also been a pastor in the church. And I think that's my primary 
calling is as a pastor. Fuller asked me if I'd come and be a professor after 10 years in this congregation. They didn't ask me to be a professor. They asked me if I'd come on a part-time, six-month instructorship (laughs) with salary only guaranteed for six months. And my husband said to me, I believe this of God. We should do it. And he was willing, and he left his career. And we took our three children, and I went to Fuller, And I remember the first time I walked into a faculty meeting as the only woman faculty person on that campus, and every seat was full with a man in it and no seat for me. And at that time, then, one man got up (laughs) and made room. And that man was Paul King Jewett. He had sent me a manuscript the year before called Man as Male and Female, and it was a book, he was a systematic theologian critiquing the work of Karl Barth. And I didn't agree with everything that was in it, but I did agree with the thesis of the book that men and women were created equal before God, and that patriarchy and discrimination was wrong. And When his book was published, a major explosive debate broke out on the Fuller campus. And I went somewhere two or three months after I had arrived as this young, part-time, maybe, faculty person. And I watched as people were flown in from Australia, scholars from around the world, to debate whether or not the scripture allowed the kind of theology which Paul King Jewett had written. And as I sat and as I watched the scholars and as they worked through the texts and the issues and the themes, I can remember clear as a bell a passionate and fierce determination that there would never again in that school be that kind of a meeting where there was no woman sitting on the panel to make that decision. And there never was again. And I stayed 12 years and was part of a process in which we came to the conclusion as a faculty that we would not only encourage women in ministry, but that we would hire no faculty who were not supportive of the ordination and the full ministries of women. It was a major turning point. During the time that I was there, we went from 70 women to 700 women students on our campus. And in 1978, after having had some wonderful experiences with the Evangelical Women's Caucus, I decided to align Fuller with EWC, and we held a conference on that campus, the first time Fuller had ever done a major conference, and it was called Women in the Ministries of Christ. And we didn't know what to expect But we had, when we finally held the conference, over 900 women and men who came from all over the country, and numbers of those women are today theological professors, senior pastors, leaders in various ways within their own Christian movements. And that was a wonderful, powerful kind of time. I was tenured as faculty member at Fuller, and made the extraordinary decision um, when I was invited to come to Eastern College, a small private Christian college on the East Coast, and become the first woman president of a Christian school that was part of what was then called the Coalition of Christian Colleges and Universities. And one of the things that was in my mind was that I had learned the language from Rosemary Ruther of the power of living on the margins. And that was very important to me. But I began translating that language as the power of the frontier. And that on the frontier, those who go first pay high prices. But they do that so that doors open for those who can come behind. And so I found in the experience at Eastern, we had not only the first woman president, the first woman provost, the first woman dean, and we were able to blaze some ground 
in terms of what was possible within that particular sphere of higher education. And I was pleased when I left that they named the center I had started for Christian women in leadership as the Heston S. Center for Christian Women in Leadership. My passion these last years has been the challenge that I see of women around the world. And I'm working now as the International Minister of World Vision, which I had chaired as a volunteer for nine years, growing from about 300 staff to 17,000 staff, working with the very poor around the world. And the challenge that I see right now of HIV AIDS and what that means for women we are estimating 75 to 80 million people with HIV AIDS by the end of this decade. And in Africa alone, that is more than 58% of the adults living and dying with HIV AIDS are women. And the injustices and the built-in abuse and discrimination is destroying the lives of women and children and men all around the world. And so I think while there is still a great deal of work to do here, there is an enormous challenge in front of us in terms of facing and fighting until we turn around the ignorance and stigma and shadows and discrimination and hatred and prejudice, which are still so destructive in the world today. I'm a woman of hope, but we have a great deal of work still to do. Thanks. <laughs>